The Eiffel Tower is in danger. The landmark has survived an occupation, two world wars, and the prospect of demolition back in 1903. But all of those threats pale in comparison to the tower's greatest enemy, rust. For more than a century, this iconic monument has been fighting an uphill battle against the wind and rain of Paris, a battle that it might now be losing. This is the $64 million fight to save the Eiffel Tower. So the Eiffel Tower was never supposed to be standing for this long. It was meant as a temporary monument for the 1889 World's Fair, to rise over Paris for just 20 years before being torn down. Now, 135 years later, it's not only still standing, but has cemented itself as one of the most beloved and iconic structures in the world. But the tower is starting to show its age. The famous Paris landmark and the symbol of love, the Eiffel Tower, is crumbling, and the only solution to stop its decay is a full renovation. Ideally, the tower was meant to be repainted every seven years, but the last restoration effort was delayed thanks to the pandemic. Now it's in the middle of a $64 million repaint to make it presentable for the 2024 Paris Olympics. However, some experts have criticized this repaint as being little more than a cosmetic touch-up, which doesn't address the advanced state of rust the tower is now in. In a confidential report leaked to French magazine Marianne, one unnamed manager said that if Gustave Eiffel, the engineer behind the tower, had visited it today, he'd have had a heart attack. Now, Gustave Eiffel actually anticipated that rust would be a problem for this tower, and he put in place plans to cope with it. But first, he had to convince Parisians not to tear it down altogether. It's the 80s. Not those 80s, the 1880s. Paris was set to host the World's Fair at the end of the decade, and the city needed something spectacular. It was to be the centenary of the French Revolution, and Paris wanted to show off the engineering skill of the French people. Well, engineering was, was really on steroids in the late 19th century, and the French called it la belle époque. So confidence was high, um, progress was embraced, and and I guess personal and corporate and national wealth was also growing. They seemingly, you know, for a while, engineers almost could do anything that was asked of them. Gustav Eiffel won a competition to design a glistering new monument with his plan for a 1,000-foot tower that was to be by far the tallest man-made structure on Earth. It would handily beat the then-current tallest, the Washington Monument. And actually before that, the tallest structures in the world were all churches and the pyramids. The Eiffel Tower was, was special because it was, by some considerable margin, the tallest man-made structure in the world at the time. It was a thousand feet high when completed 300 metres. And it retained that position as the tallest man-made structure for 40 years. While Eiffel is now synonymous with the tower that takes his name, he was also one of the greatest engineering minds of the 19th century. Among his many achievements were the Porto Viaduct and the Statue of Liberty. His initial designs for the Eiffel Tower took his engineering concepts to incredible new heights. The first challenge was figuring out how to build something that tall that wasn't also impossibly heavy. When the Washington Monument was being built, it kept sinking into the ground because of the enormous weight of all the marble and granite it's formed from. Eiffel solved this problem by making his tower out of iron, a lightweight but strong material. It looked quite literally like something from a Jules Verne novel. A large pylon with four columns made of latticework girders that met at the top. To make it more palatable to the general public, architect Stephen Silvestra was brought on board to tidy up the design. He gave us the stonework legs, the arches that link the columns with the first levels, and the bulb-like crown at the top. The first thing to, to point out is that the original concept for the Eiffel Tower was not Gustav Eiffel himself. It was two of his employees, uh, Maurice Kirchlin and Emil Nugier. And they, they, they worked in their own time and prepared designs for this idea that they had for the 1889 exposition. And they showed their drawings to 
Gustave. Uh, Sylvester was asked to improve the aesthetic of what they had come up with as engineering solutions to a very tall tower. Because nothing like this had ever been built before, Eiffel had to take special consideration of the enormous wind pressures the tower would face at varying heights. The wind resistance is a really neat feature of uh, Eiffel's approach to the design and the analogies with great trees like great oaks where, and, or sequoias where the trunk gets progressively broader and broader as it gets to the root system. The distinctive curves are the product of Eiffel's mathematical equations to create the most wind-resistant form. If the tower had been built as a simple straight line, it would have wobbled dangerously back and forth. This design tricks the wind into travelling downwards. The lattice structure also evenly distributes loads across the framework so that when high winds do hit, it remains stable. Today, those calculations would be tested out with models on computers well before the tower was constructed. But back then, Eiffel only had his theories. They were gambling two years of work and the modern equivalency of $37 million. The pressure was immense. Construction began on July 1st, 1887. While the Washington Monument took several decades to build, the Eiffel Tower took just 22 months. But it was really cleverly built, it was efficiently built in only two years, which is quite impressive, and had a fairly small workforce of a few hundred only, steel workers and then teams of painters, of course. And Eiffel used some really smart techniques for craneage uh, that was designed to climb the sides of the tower on lift rails as progressively the tower emerged and got higher and higher. But the structure wasn't built where it is today. Every part of it was made in Eiffel's factories on the outskirts of Paris. All 18,000 pieces were then taken to the Champs de Mars and assembled to an accuracy of a tenth of a millimeter, like a giant Lego set. At one point, there were up to 300 workers on site using small steam cranes and scaffolding to build the tower. More than 2.5 million rivets would hold it all together. Then, on December 7th, 1887, all four of the girders met in the middle and began their vertical ascent upwards, racing into the sky. Finally, it was given four coats of red lead paint. That's right, the Eiffel Tower once more closely resembled the Golden Gate Bridge than the bronze structure it is today. The tallest tower on Earth and a wonder of the modern world was then marked complete, and the French absolutely hated it. Parisians are not known for their restraint when it comes to handing out critiques. It is, after all, a French word. The tower was labelled a truly tragic street lamp, a half-built factory pipe, and incomplete, confused, and deformed. To his credit, Gustave Eiffel worked tirelessly to defend his structure. He asked his detractors could there not be beauty within his engineering marvel. Public opinion was, I think, a different story, and that was steadily improving as the tower was growing. By the time it opened in 1879, it had two million visitors in the first six months. Now, that doesn't suggest it was an unwelcome imposition on the you know, general Parisians or visitors to the, to the exposition. So it very, very quickly became a worldwide icon. The tower was set to be torn down in 20 short years, and in 1903, plans for demolition were seriously considered. To try and save the tower, Eiffel funded several scientific uses for it, ranging from meteorological observations to wireless telegraphy. It even became of particular military interest when they found it could transmit and receive long-distance signals. All of these efforts ultimately helped to save the tower, and even to this day it plays a vital role in television and radio broadcasts. Now, after decades of hard work, all Eiffel could hope for was that future generations would take care of his monuments as well as he had. A series of reports over the last few years have turned up some troubling results. One in 2010 urged the operating company for the tower to come up with a completely new maintenance policy. One in 2014 found cracks and rusting throughout the structure and that only 10% of the new paint was actually adhering to the tower. Another in 2016 showed there were 885 faults, including 68 that posed serious risk to its durability. A third of the tower was set to be stripped and have two new coats applied. 
But thanks to delays caused by the pandemic and worrying levels of lead in the old paint, only 5% of the tower is now being treated. Unfortunately, experts are warning that this $64 million repaint could actually make defects in the existing layer of paint worse, resulting in more corrosion, while the operating company is nervous to close the tower for any extended periods of time. You see, the Eiffel Tower attracts some 7 million visitors and brings in nearly 100 million euros of revenue every year. And unfortunately, the operating costs can often exceed that number. Painting the tower is no easy task, and it's done in much the same way as it was 135 years ago, with scaffolding or painters abseiling off the side of the structure. They strip, clean, and apply rust proofing before adding a final coat of paint. The tower is built using puddle iron, in theory a material that could last forever as long as it's maintained and prevented from rusting. If this multi-million dollar repaint proves to be just a band-aid, then it's going to be up to future Parisians to ensure the integrity of the monument. The Eiffel Tower is one of those rare structures that has transcended the rivets and bolts it's made of. It's more than just an observation structure or antenna or a glitzy monument for a long ago exhibition. It's one of the most recognizable buildings in the world. In that way, Gustav Eiffel has ended up having the last laugh against all of his critics. He was right, there is an astounding and timeless beauty in his engineering. If I would be absolutely delighted that the tower is still there after all these years and uh, would, would feel also partly vindicated that his, 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 his life left a, an enduring legacy that now, now not just Parisians but the world uh, loves and would be greatly, greatly saddened if, if there ever came a time when the, the tower had to be demolished for safety reasons. Don't forget that we're inspiring the next generation of builders through our investment into BrickBorrow, a fantastic LEGO subscription service. You can learn more and get started today over at BrickBorrow.com. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you subscribe to the B1M.